The floor is yours and you'll be joining the panel shortly afterwards. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to address this important summit. I'm very pleased to be here in Abu Dhabi, which is IATA's home in the GCC countries. Now, before beginning my prepared remarks, I did just want to take a moment to discuss the continuing search for MH370. Our thoughts are still with the families and friends of all those on board. And as we gather here, cooperative efforts continue on an unprecedented scale to find the aircraft, to understand what happened, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Now, accident investigation takes time, and speculation on the cause won't provide any solutions. But even before the investigation begins, some challenges have already come to light. We must never let another aircraft go missing in this way again. And IATA will launch a task force soon that by the end of this year will establish an industry position on how to improve aircraft tracking so we know where to look for it should something unfortunate happen. Safety is our top priority and every accident rededicates industry and governments to making flying even safer. And this has been at the very heart of the industry since its very inception. And that will never change. And I'd like to begin addressing the theme of the summit by recalling this is a very special year for the air transport industry. 2014 marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of scheduled commercial aviation. In 1903, the Wright brothers launched the era of powered, heavier-than-air flight, and flying started with the partnership of two brothers. And a decade later, its commercial potential was recognized by a small team of an aircraft builder, a pilot, an entrepreneur, and, of course, a real hero, a man called Abram File, who became the first commercial passenger with a 23-minute flight across Tampa Bay in Florida. And in the century that's followed, aviation's opened up possibilities that have enriched people's lives and turned our big planet into a small world. The industry's economic footprint is impressive, supporting jobs for 57 million people and facilitating $2.2 trillion in economic activity. This year, we expect airlines to transport safely 3.3 billion people and 50 million tons of cargo, over 40,000 routes with nearly 100,000 flights a day. And it's hard to believe that it all began with one company, one plane, one route, and one passenger. Now, fortunately, we're marking our centennial year with a profitable year. We expect a collective airline industry profit of $18.7 billion this year, and that's a record in absolute terms, but the average margin, 2.5%, indicates how difficult it is to make ends meet. Airlines in the Middle East are expected to contribute $2.2 billion to the global profit, and that's also a record. The fast-growing Gulf area is, of course, at the center of the region's success. And the UAE is a great example of just how powerful the aviation industry can be as an economic force, including the impact of aviation-related tourism. Over 430,000 UAE jobs are related to aviation, and 14.7% of GDP is linked to it. With numbers like that, there can be no doubt in the wisdom of the governments in this region who've seen aviation as a strategic asset and have created a policy environment that facilitates its success. And that success is making its mark globally. In just over a decade, the region's share of global traffic has grown from 4% to 9%. Now, in early June, we'll host the world's airline community in Doha for the IATA annual general meeting, which is a great platform to showcase the Gulf success story. And it includes respected global airlines, Etihad, Emirates, and Qatar among them. No frills airlines are also making their mark in this region. And many of this region's airlines are integrating with the global industry through alliances, strategic partnerships, and equity investments. 
and airline operations are being facilitated by airport partners who themselves are undergoing a massive investment program. Now there's a third ingredient in the success story about which I'm a bit concerned and that's air traffic management. Airspace is finite so capacity can only grow with efficiency. Now each country has invested in impressive technology but effective management needs regional and international teamwork. And there are some challenges. For example, between 40 and 60% of the airspace around here is reserved for the military. So we're trying to squeeze the fast growing civil aviation component into a fraction of the airspace. One solution is developing partnerships and trust with the military to open more flexible use zones. And that's happening progressively but it is not keeping pace with demand for air travel. And over time, we've made management of the airspace more complex. Historically, there was one FIR, one flight information region for the Arabian Peninsula, Bahrain. And from the early 1980s, it began to be fragmented and today there are six FIRs. Now for an airline, the most important thing is to get from point A to point B as smoothly as possible. And the challenge for air navigation service providers is to work together to make that happen as seamlessly across six FIRs as if there were only one. I'm pleased to see there are several uh, regional working groups that are trying to build a common vision for working together. Congestion is a real and rising problem and it grows with every aircraft that's delivered. Unless it's dealt with quickly, the efficient hub operations which are supporting the region's success will begin to unravel. So please learn from the mistakes of Europe. The single aviation market created enormous demand for air connectivity, but this wasn't matched with a single European sky. And the result is an inefficient and fragmented air traffic management system that is a burden on European competitiveness. Aviation in the Gulf is a great success story and air traffic gridlock should not become its Achilles heel. The players in the region need to buy in urgently to a vision for seamless airspace management and then work together in a team effort to make it happen. In addition to, in addition to regional cooperation, I wanted to introduce another concept to think about as this summit unfolds and that's global standards. Global connectivity is possible because of global standards. And I ask as a staunch supporter and defender of global standards. We make industry commercial standards in some areas and we support ICAO, which has the same mandate for go from governments. Global standards provide a way for industry partners to work together. They form a common language, so to speak. And I attribute a large part of the success of aviation in the Gulf to the importance that the stakeholders in the region, that is governments and industry, have placed on global standards. So I urge you please to stay the course and resist the urge to fragment global standards with local variations. And whether it's passenger rights, requirements for advanced passenger information, or the adoption of important treaties like the Montreal Convention, the more we can place global standards at the center of regulations, the more solid is the foundation for everybody's success. Global standards aren't just for governments. We've seen how the hard work of converting to e-ticketing has benefited everyone in the travel chain, including the passengers. There are plenty of other commercial standards which could provide broad benefits as well. The IATA Fast Travel Program helps airlines, airports and others smooth the passenger journey with self-service options. On the security side, we're working with Airports Council International to promote smart security, a risk-based approach that will improve effectiveness and the passenger experience at airport security checkpoints. And in the cargo part of the business, the e-freight project promises broad benefits throughout the supply chain with better customer service, shorter transit times, and more efficient processes. Now in this area, Dubai is a global leader having mandated the e-airway bill. And because of its rapid growth, this region is uniquely placed to benefit as a leader 
in early adoption. That will need collaboration between industry players, but the result will be the competitive advantage of being at the forefront of efforts to promote efficiency and customer service. Now, from what I've said, you can easily anticipate my response to the panel discussion question of whether partnerships and collaboration can lead to an increase in returns across the industry, and I'm eager to engage in the discussion. A strong vision for aviation's future, supported by cooperation and global standards, has laid the foundation for a very successful air transport sector. And that foundation becomes stronger the more we work together as partners. And I'm absolutely confident that the Gulf region will play an ever more crucial role in aviation's second century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, that issue of air traffic management, particularly what you've said about uh, this region and elsewhere, I know it's something IART has been working on long and hard, but also enormous frustrations. So surely that's something about partnerships and collaboration uh, we need to address when Tony comes back um, onto the platform. In about 10 minutes, we'll hear now from Tony Douglas. Tony, if you'd like to come up um, onto the platform. Uh, Tony is aiming for a very specific date in about three years from now, Tony, as Chief Executive of the uh, Airports Authority, um, the airport, um, the enormous operation you have out there. Tell us about the progress and what collaboration and partnership are doing for you and hope all is going well. Salam alaikum. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's perhaps appropriate if I start with a confession. And uh, my confession is about what really attracted me many years ago to the wonderful industry that we all share together in this room. And it was two things. One is the title of this slide, Innovation, which of course has been ever present since the launch of Powered Aviation. And the other thing is a gentleman who's in this room today Mr. Buzz Aldrin, you inspired a generation of people to want to do something very special in aviation. And therefore, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, particularly the older generation, such as myself, and I can see others like me in the audience, to inspire younger people to want to be attracted to this incredible sector. Because the innovation that has been present over the last 110 years is running at a pace today that I believe is far greater than any time in the past. And of course, as you would all accept, powered flight can't exist without a place to take off and land. I submit to you, the audience, that the airport, of course, is the engine room of this act. And therefore, what I'd like to give you is a sneak preview as to what's coming here in Abu Dhabi in the very soon. If I can introduce Abu Dhabi Airport's company, it's very clear that we have a mandate, and that mandate is structured precisely to the economic vision of 2030. The wise leadership of Abu Dhabi have laid out a very clear plan. That plan identifies key areas of economic diversity, many of which have been discussed already this morning. But of course, it goes without saying, all successful economies have well-developed transport infrastructure. And therefore, our mandate, as you can see from this slide, is to facilitate the growth of aviation within the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, but also, as a red-blooded capitalist, to make sure that it's done in a commercially satisfactory matter, uh, manner. I'm sure that's the same mandate pretty much that we all have in common. And many of you will have hopefully uh, passed through uh, Abu Dhabi International Airport. We're very proud that it's acknowledged and it has been for the last three years as being the best airport within the region. But the tradition of hospitality of which the United Arab Emirates prides itself in 
needs a gateway in particular to the capital city that it can continue to be proud of. And therefore, if I can take you through what I believe to be a phenomenal journey over very recent history. This is the first Abu Dhabi International Airport and many of you in the audience will recognize this iconic picture. It's still located on Abu Dhabi Island and it was at the time of the foundation of this incredible nation in 1971. And you can see during that year, 170,000 passengers passed through Abu Dhabi Airport as it was then. And I can tell you, that was an incredible number of passengers given the infrastructure, of course, that was available at that point in time. But in this incredible journey um, of development, this picture is probably more familiar to many of you. And this is Terminal 1 at Abu Dhabi International Airport as it is today. And I almost teased the audience as to what date do you believe that this photograph is taken from as I reveal it. But before I reveal it, just hold the mental reference of the size of the dome of the Terminal 1 structure, which many of you who've been in it has that beautiful mosaic uh, dome structure within it. Just hold that image in your mind as, of course, I reveal that this was little over a decade later and that growth story of 170,000 passengers of course then gone to 2.4 million. So phenomenal growth in a relatively short period of time. But as we've talked about um, already today or as, as James has uh, indicated in his presentation, the future of Abu Dhabi International Airport will benefit from this truly iconic structure. And uh, this structure, to give you a, a sense of it, um, you can see the arrangement. It's got four piers. It's over 700,000 square meters of space. And I'll try and scale it in slightly more appropriate ways uh, later on. But importantly, we believe that this, from an iconic standpoint, will be as instantly recognizable as the international landmarks that I finger sketch. So for example, these kind of shapes, people might say Sydney Opera House. These kind of shapes, people might say the Eiffel Tower, of course, in Paris. We believe in the future, when people see that shape, it will be instantly recognizable as Abu Dhabi International Airport, the gateway to the capital city, the home of Etihad Airways. And all world-class airlines need a world-class home. I believe we're talking about the best airline in the world, and therefore it deserves the best home possible. And we believe that this will be present for the traveling public to enjoy in 2017, by which time we estimate Abu Dhabi International Airport will be handling over 27 and a half million passengers. So that growth story and the innovation that goes with, uh, behind it, we believe is very, very exciting indeed, and something that we'd like everybody to share the message about, and particularly to the younger generation, of course. So back to scaling it. What does 700,000 square meters look like? Well, for those of you who are familiar with London Heathrow Terminal 5, including the two satellites, this is about one and a half times bigger. If you're familiar with the incredible Terminal 3 at Dubai International Airport, then again, this is about one and a half times bigger. Put quite simply, it's the largest terminal building under one roof anywhere in the world. It's got 65 uh, contact stands. It's the home of the largest automated baggage system in the world. And back to that picture I asked you to hold in your mind a little earlier about Terminal 1, the, the pier ends um, at 
Okay, I can't make the laser work, so um, you'll have to work with me here. So in terms of the end of, of the, uh, the pier ends, each of those are the same size as Terminal 1 that's currently in existence at Abu Dhabi International Airport. The length of each of those piers is the same size as Terminal 3 at Abu Dhabi International Airport currently. So basically, the whole of Abu Dhabi International Airport today fits in one of those piers, of which there are four, um, as well as the central area, which sits underneath a 52-metre uh, ceiling. So uh, if, again, if you can visualise 52 metres, we're sat in a space here where this roof is just over 10 metres high. Imagine five times higher than this, which is the floor plate on the departures level to the top of the ceiling. A truly remarkable uh, environment for travellers. And the final way of scaling it, of course, for those of you who've enjoyed walking around this incredible, uh, this incredible hotel, is that's the whole of this St. Regis Hotel put in the middle of the central processing space. So in summary, we believe that the gateway to the capital city will be an absolutely amazing uh, experience to people who come to the capital city. I'm going to use a short film now, really just to give you a sense of uh, progress. And uh, this just runs uh, from September of last year. You can see the northern runway on the top of the picture there. This is actually the front of the building. You can see in the ground the uh, orientation of those four piers. And by October of last year, this was quite a symbolic milestone because it was the transition between the substructure, the below ground space, to the start of the roof sequence. This is that automated baggage system. It is a tote-based system. Every bag's on its own individually uh, tracked uh, tray. And that was a test loop that we did with the provider in Denmark. That was less than 1% of the total system. And as you can see here by January of 2014, we've now become uh, a project that's above ground. Interestingly, because it's parallel uh, to the major highway in Abu Dhabi, it's a spectator sport now. Lots of people drive past it uh, every day and observe the progress because we've got 18,000 people working on the site today. And uh, this is the incredible sight of over what a relatively small period of time, 18,000 guys working as a focus team can deliver. You can see the orientation on the shot just before this at Pier 1, Pier 2, Pier 3, Pier 4. This is the uh, central departures uh, space. Um, and those steel arches you could see um, just a, a slightly earlier give you a sense under which Etihad's guests, our travellers, will enjoy a truly amazing experience when it's completed and it looks precisely like this. Um, it's an icon in our opinion. It's another symbol of the aviation innovation that I started off with and the way in which we have a very clear promise. And that promise is, is we'll deliver the new midfield terminal project to Etihad's guests and the traveling public precisely at 0700 hours on the 17th, 07, 2017. And that's a promise. We'd like to invite all of you to come and enjoy in that celebration, but importantly, help us stimulate the excitement of the next generation to want to be part of this. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Tony. Tony, stay up there. Thank you, Tony. Uh, let me invite everyone uh, who's on the panel to come up here, um, including uh, Jeff and uh, also uh, Camille as well. Because uh, we want to pick up and do keep uh, the messages coming. Uh, we've got uh, literally 
a maximum of 30 minutes uh, on this uh, panel uh, to pick up on a number of points. Let me remind you that we are talking uh, essentially about can partnerships and collaboration lead to an increase, an increase in returns across the aviation industry? And Tony, hearing from Tony that it's, there's a 2.5% margin now on, uh, for airlines over the coming year, Tony, I don't remember hearing that at many IATA conferences for a long time, the idea of a 2.5% margin. That's a, a, a very, very positive prediction for, for this year. So. I'd like to pick up on, on a number of the points um, which you were raising um, and particularly go to Camille Erlings, who's Chief Executive for KLM, who's joined us as well, along with Jeff Poole, uh, Director General of CANSO. Uh, let me, first of all, Camille, come to you. KLM, Air France, um, partnerships, collaboration, what does that produce for you? Well, for KLM, the Dutch Royal Airlines partnership is the main reason why we are still here, being the oldest still existing airline flying under its own flag. We will be 95 years old this year. But the fact that we're not 95 years old, but 95 years young, always pioneering, having the courage to do new things, working together with other partners, is the reason why we are still growing. We are bigger than we were ever before, and we could never have done that without being part of an ever-glowing partnership with many other airlines. We truly believe in that. Where do you see it going? Because you're sitting next to a chief executive who in many ways has a different model for partnerships. You have a particular model, uh, Air France KLM. Where do you see that going? There are many different, many different models. Of course, there is the old model of the three global alliances. And let's not underestimate <laughs> the number of ASKs, the flown kilometers, being part of those three alliances has only grown from 40% to 60% of all the available seat kilometers uh, worldwide. And it will continue to grow. But what is interesting is that within these three alliances, one partnership is not the other. If I look at SkyTeam, for instance, the partnership of KLM, uh, of course, with Air France, we're now one company, but also with Delta Airlines and some Chinese <coughs> partners is much deeper than with certain others. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, there are also other partnerships arising that are going over the border of such a traditional alliance. And I'm very happy to be here with my friend James Hogan. I'm very inspired by Etihad Airways, the way in which it treats its guests, the way in which it's investing in quality and in growth. And we are proud to be a partner of Etihad Airways, even if Etihad is not part of Sky Team Alliance. That doesn't hamper us. I think the main thing is what was said in the last panel. You need to trust each other. You need to feel the commitment to make it something of many years that is there to stay. And you need to create a structure that makes it a structural win-win for the two parties involved. And that's why we are working on deepening our partnership with Etihad Airways. Picking up on several issues that have been raised already, but particularly this overarching impact at the moment, Camille, uh, of, um, of bottom lines and the, the challenges for costs at the moment, particularly with the liberalization of economies, particularly with the low-cost airlines and so on. How do you see partnerships and collaboration developing then in the coming, say, three or four years? You're asking me? I think that partnerships will really become uh, much, much, much more important. If I look at our situation, the partnership with Delta is a full metal neutrality, which means we have one company over the ocean, still called a joint venture because we cannot merge because of all the government restrictions. Uh, but it doesn't matter to us whether you fly Delta or KLM or Air France over the ocean. We will earn the same amount of money. It's full metal neutral. We want to do that with our Chinese partners as well. We're investing in South America, we took a share in gold, and there will be KLM sign outside and inside every gold plane, giving our passengers, our guests, a feeling that they are flying a, a real, true partner of KLM. Uh, with the African partner, Kenya, which we're a big shareholder of, we have doubled our joint venture over the last year. But I really hope, and that's why I'm so excited to be here in Abu Dhabi, I'm always excited being here, I really hope that James, and the team of Air France and KLM will prove that we will also manage a deep and structural partnership of a legacy carrier of Europe and the Middle Eastern carrier. KLM was the first, together with Air France, to move in from Europe. We said, we think we can do this. And it's not easy, but we think we can deepen it, share our revenues, make it a structural win-win. And we need to find these kind of answers because it is absolutely certain that the Middle East will play an ever bigger role but the Middle East will never do it alone. We need partnerships of people and companies that trust each other. 
And so that is what I see as a big challenge also for the upcoming years. In the limited time we have, I want to pick up on ATM and the points that Tony raised, and also Canso, if I may, in a moment, because I've got one question here from uh, Mick Adams of Monarch uh, Aircraft Engineering. How do airlines like Etihad or KLM ensure that its brand and service is not diluted by its partnerships? Camille. I think, first of all, by really uh, creating certain common standards. Uh, with Delta Airlines, we both created economy comfort as an, as an ancillary revenue. It's exactly the same, we're selling it from each other. With Gold Airlines in South America, they also created comfort. So you try to more or less align your product. We were inspired by Etihad calling the passengers as guests. That's what we also start to do, not just in wording, but also increasing the quality uh, of our product. But the main thing is that you offer a global product reaching every destination in a reliable and very short travel time. And that is what a company can never do alone and that is where is the big win-win. We don't have the ambition to be big in India as Air France KLM. We don't have it. But via the partnership with Etihad, we can offer many destinations. The same accounts to Australia. Then on the other hand, we are very strong over the transatlantic, very strong to South America. And I think there we can be of value to Etihad and other partners. So James, that question from Mick Adams. Uh, brand and service, the danger of being diluted by partnerships. The consumer and buyer behavior is changing. So I think the most important aspect, the most important aspect is, is connectivity. And that's what we do offer is, is connectivity in an environment where the buyer of the future is going to be focused on digital strategy. So the first aspect is can I get from one point of the world to the other? We've been very clear through our distribution strategies that the guest is aware of which metal that they're boarding. Nevertheless, if you look at our partners, certainly with Jet Airways in India, you've got an outstanding level of service in their own right. With Air Berlin, we've in fact reconfigured their business class on their A330s over the past 24 months. So in fact, we have a common business class product. If you look at Air Serbia and Air Seychelles, we've actually introduced, retrained their cabin crew. So you are seeing commonality. The other key aspect is obviously the frequent flyer program, how we're able to offer a earn and burn proposition across the group. And even with our talks with Air France and KLM, that would be the next stage of our partnership. So we're talking about consumers in a global market. We're bound, as you know, Nick, by the bilateral structure, by the Chicago Convention, to truly be a global industry. It's about working smarter. And the way we've embraced with KLM and Air France is an example that the rule book is changing. As I said, our structure is organic, it's equity, but it's also a whole range of co-chair partners in One World, Star Alliance, and Sky, Sky Team, because the CEOs today are having discussions like we're having. How do you win on bilateral? How do you win on network cooperation? So yes, there's room for alliances, but even within the alliances, they're changing their rules of how they work with non-alliance airlines such as us. Tony, anything from IATA on the principles, if you like, the models on this issue of collaboration, partnership, and the kind of thing that both Camille and James have been talking about? Well, I think we, I mean, we, we know, the, the, the IATA as an association is, if you like, an observer of, the, uh, of what our members getting up to uh, in, in forming partnerships, but quite clearly, um, the, these sort of partnerships that uh, Camille and, and James have been talking about are adding, adding, adding value to uh, individual airlines because it, incre it increases their reach, increases their scope, increases their customer proposition. Um, in some cases, can also help to reduce uh, unit costs and so on. So clearly, this is what people are doing. And, and, and in, a, in a world where you cannot um, form cross-border consolidation. You can't buy and sell each other airlines across borders for reasons we're all familiar with. Um, it seems that these, these sort of deals and these kind of arrangements are going to become ever more um, important and ever more common. Okay, we've got 20 minutes to run on this panel, so if you've got any thoughts, please send them to me. You can see the way I can inject them into the conversation at the right minute. Um, Jeff, let me pick up on you, if I may, because um, obviously Canso, I want to pick up on certainly what we heard from Randy, what we've heard from Tony as well, but how important is it for you to have this level of partnership and collaboration now among airlines and between airlines and within airlines in terms of pushing forward your agenda? 
Um, in, in a word, it's, ma it's mandatory. I mean, we all know that aviation is a, aviation is a, a global industry. It's very complex, and it works on an, on an integrated basis. Um, but as people think about aviation, they think about aircraft and, and, air, and airports, because that's the very visible side of aviation. Air traffic management is and should be invisible. The only time you notice it is when something goes wrong, when your plane is, uh, plane is delayed, or if there's an unfortunate uh, incident like the loss of MH370. Now, in, 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 in moving forward on this, uh, we have to recognize that air traffic management is an integral part of the aviation value chain, and it needs to move in step with the capacity and efficiency of, of the rest of the aviation chain. That's not happening because we've done a marvelous job of fragmenting air traffic management. It's fragmented on a national basis, uh, on civil and military, on different uh, systems and equipments, different procedures, etc. So we've got a real job of work to be done that can only be done in partnership and cooperation. We know what we need to do operationally and uh, technically, but transforming air traffic management in the way that we all want to see it is a huge task that can only be done in collaboration. Let me pick up on the detail in a moment, but let me just also pick up on that principle of you've got competition in the airline business at the same time as you're asking for a collaboration. Is that tension something of a paradox where it's still quite difficult for those who are running airlines to come together when it's necessary for this kind of issue of ATM? Jeff. Um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting issue because, of course, in air traffic management, we've got a series of uh, national uh, monopolies that, that run air traffic management. And, and we, we, that doesn't give us the same driving force as, as with the airlines in competition with each other uh, and, indeed, with the, with the commercial imperatives of, of airports. So in air traffic management, we need to find some new business models that drive performance. And we, but we can, again, we can only do that in... Uh, with the airlines and, and airports in, in synchronized way. Well, let me try and nail this issue, uh, because Tony, you put it very clearly on the agenda, and, and Randy did as well, talking about a 10% cut in fuel costs, uh, no, li no less, uh, if much more could be done about this. Let me get from all of you your perspective of how this can be achieved. I remember the long battle you had in southern China, just getting better access to Hong Kong, and that took a long time. Where is this initiative going to come from? Where is the impetus going to come from to prevent, quote, this gridlock, which you're warning about here in this region, Tony? Well, I think, I mean, in, in this region, we are, we are seeing ever-increasing problems um, of delay and congestion in, in the Gulf area. And I think um, all the, the, the big airlines, the big three, if you like, of, of, of Etihad, Emirates, and Qatar, are becoming increasingly, um, increasingly affected by these, by these problems. Um, what, what it really needs, and, and they're the ones really who are, gonna, who are, I think, necessary to keep the pressure on their governments to... Uh, to get this problem sorted out. Um, it does need the governments to, to sit down together in a, in a, in a very cooperative spirit, in a spirit of co cooperation. But how much do the airlines have to keep pushing them? How receptive are the governments to pressure? Well, Nick, I would airlines. argue that the airlines worldwide are pushing very hard on this track. You know, as we mentioned, these are mainly you know, government-controlled policy. It's just not the goal for the Middle East. We see it in Europe, and there's a real desire by the aviation industry, by airlines, to see change, to see common space, to see more effective utilization of airspace, and not seeing it as a, as a cash cow for some countries. So, Jeff, where are the obstacles at the moment? Uh, f for me, as I said, we know what to do operationally and technically. The, 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 the obstacles are political and institutional and, and also in the business models of air navigation service providers. There's some fantastic work being done on air traffic management in this region, but all the time that, that is within the confines of a national boundary, it's always going to be suboptimal. So, so what we has have been to have this vision of, uh, get to this vision of, of, of regional airspace and operate on the basis of traffic flows, not national boundaries. So what has been learned from, uh, Tony talked about, you remind us all of the debacle of European skies. What's been learned from the European experience which needs to be built on very quickly in order to prevent what you, Tony, talked about as gridlock? Camille. Well, I think what the European example has learned is that much more pressure is needed indeed. 
because after years of talk, and I'm very much a pro-European citizen, but after more than a decade of talks, we achieved almost nothing. Yeah. I had the honor to be keynote speaker at the Kanzo AGM and the Dutch Caribbean island yes. of Curaçao with Jeff uh, and, and, and our other friends over there. And you saw the differences of the European participants there, really seeing, uh, part of them seeing air traffic control as a vital infrastructure, as a means, and others seeing it as a target as such, as a goal as such. Europe is not capable till now to really change the airspace and make it one. I'll give you a striking example. The European Commissioner dealing with this, Sim Kalas, he has tried for various times to push to get a true one airspace. It would mean 11% less flight hours because we could fly straight. Now we fly 11% too much. Too much kerosene, too much flying time, too much uh, money spent. Too much pollution to the environment. A minister of one of the biggest nations called him. He said, well, you know, I have a problem with 60 employees of my national air traffic control. And these 60 make a lot of noise. So publicly, I will oppose you. But privately, I tell you, push, push, and just push it through against me. I mean, this is a show of big weakness. Is there That's a model which any of you can help us uh, understand when you talk, Tony, about the, the significant um, um, influence here of the military in this region, which, of course, has been the case in France as well? Um, what about the, the way in which the military can be persuaded to give up space, any of you? So it should be a co we should form a coalition, and this is very beautiful. This a political coalition, coalition or corporate coalition? Well, in, in Europe, the military is starting to move mm -hmm. because, because there are many models where, if needed, you can secure a part of the airspace for the military, but not on a structural basis. So the military starts to think flexible about which part of the airspace they need on which moment in time. And that's what's happened in my country, the Netherlands, where the military and the civil now really work together better than ever before. What we should do is form a coalition between our industry, which is the hard economics and the hard logistics, and the environmentalists. And this is a funny, uh, a funny opportunity, because even the environmentalists will lobby with us to create efficiency in airspace. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're moving on in this debate on civil and military, because it used to be a very confrontational one. And, and you used exactly the right words. Why should the military give up their airspace? Well, it shouldn't be a question of winners and losers at all. This is all about common sense, driving benefits, driving the environmental issues, as Camille said. And, and we're, we're getting there now, I think. But it, but it needs that structured debate and the, the more intelligent approach than just confrontational who's, who owns that particular part of the airspace. And Nick, if you look here in the Gulf, certainly in the Gulf with the, the GCAA, with the various UAE authorities, that discussion is happening. I think there's a broader issue, whether it goes outside the, GC, you know, the, the Gulf states or the, the broader Middle East, but it's just not unique to this part of the world. I think in, within national jurisdictions, people know they need to be managed more effectively, but it is still a long process. But Tony has to use that phrase gridlock. I mean, you, you went that far, Tony, to say there, there could easily be gridlock in a region like this. When you look at the um, growth plans of the major carriers here and indeed the, the other carriers, um, uh, something is, needs to be done to improve the use of airspace or those growth plans are going to be impossible. And you know, Tony, you've got a wonderful airport you're building there, but it won't be any good if people can't come and go from it because there's no room up above it. And uh, that means governments are going to have to work together, as Jeff says, you know, to, to look at this sort of process of, you know, how can we keep traffic flowing, not, you know, how can I keep control over my airspace? It needs to have a completely different mindset when we look at it. And uh, by the way, not, not just in this, in this region either. Um, and, and, and if you want to learn the lessons of Europe, look how Europe does it and then do the opposite. Um, I mean, it, what's going on in Europe is a, is a disgrace and everybody involved should be thoroughly ashamed of themselves. I think there's a, lot to, there's a lot more to be said on this, but in the last 10 minutes uh, on collaboration and partnership, let me just pick up, if I may, some of the other points which are being made, which brings in Tony Douglas as well. Is your airport big enough, given that we're, the gridlock's being warned about? There's one question here from Hamish Harding from Action Aviation and Yusuf El Garib from Global Aviation Investment. Does the panel see a low-cost carrier model similar to that of Fly Dubai being la launched in Abu Dhabi, which of course puts enormous pressure on the gates that you're building for two 2017. Okay, well, I think. Um, Microphone. 
Yeah, yeah. I think perhaps if I could just go back to the um, earlier part of the debate very quickly first. And uh, words like common sense uh, were used. Um, and without trying to trivialize it and overly simplify it, if one looks at the historical models, Europe wouldn't be a bad uh, place to look at, as has already been mentioned. It typically went around airfield capacity, then terminal capacity, back to airfield capacity, back to terminal capacity, then it was the capacity of the sky. And I would suggest the cycle that we're on at the moment here is we've done airfield capacity, terminal capacity, airfield capacity, we're now back to terminal capacity and therefore following the same sequence, back to basics would suggest for sure uh, the capacity of the sky uh, is uh, the next big uh, thought-provoking challenge for us all. Um, in, in terms of the question that you've just uh, posed, um, my colleague on my far right here um, and the other airlines that use Abu Dhabi International Airport are doing a phenomenal job. Uh, the growth story speaks for itself. Um, in February this year, we were 15.6% up on passenger numbers from the prior year. And I think, you know, as we've, we've covered already in conference, that those sorts of numbers aren't witnessed uh, anywhere else uh, in the world. Um, in my line of business, therefore, this is what we pray for every day. It would be categorized as a high-class problem. Is it a problem? Yes, it is, but the right sort of problem that you would always wish to have. Um, because we have to work now doubly hard to catch up with providing the quality of infrastructure to allow James and the other airlines um, to satisfy their guests and meet uh, the growth that's there. And that's why that midfield terminal is so important to deliver precisely at the point in time that we're making the promise against. Fascinating question here, uh, James and, and others. Uh, from Kenny Goggin of Strata, how do you plan to work with your direct competitors here in the Gulf, whether it be on air traffic management or on uh, other issues as well? Well, we're working with uh, Emirates, with the, uh, the other Gulf carriers today on air traffic management. We're working on security. There are very important common areas where we have to collaborate and the relationship is strong, as it should be. And uh, obviously there's a commercial relationship, but when it comes to safety, air traffic management, security, we're one. Question here from Chris Jones. What plans are there in the region to ensure fuel security that isn't dependent on oil production as part of collaboration and participation? Do you see this as an issue, any of you? Camille, do you have a, a well, view I on this? I think it is, it is very important that the industry is working on uh, sustainable uh, development. I'm proud that uh, Air France and KLM for the ninth time, and, ninth time in a row have been number one on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which, which doesn't say so much other than that our company is very committed that this one of the first movers in becoming sustainable. Are we sustainable? N by far not enough. And that is why we need to use our strengths all over the industry and our creativity to find new ways. Of course, new aircraft help a lot, but if you want to really change the environment on short term, we need to start using the biofuel in a much bigger way, uh, add percentages of biofuel uh, to traditional kerosene can already help a lot reducing emissions, also creating a little bit less dependency on the fossil fuel only. The problem there of course is the scalability. All the right production of biofuel that doesn't hamper the food or the water or the nature in other countries, that production is very limited. And everyone is looking to which production will be the production of the future. What I want to say is also here partnerships will make the difference. We invested heavily in a company that is now world leader in brokering with chemical companies and other ones to find the biofuel of the future and I think they're also joining forces will help. It's an expensive investment but we are confident in the upcoming years biofuel will be scalable and it will become a structural part of the uh, jet fuel that will be used all over the world. Jeff, one minute only uh, before we have to close. I, I, the, in the notes before um, this, this uh, session, uh, you've talked about um, having the need for having clearly identified projects and real deliverables and timescales, a danger of talking about collaboration but not really working out what's practical. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. I think, and with uh, great respect to conferences like this, we, we need to stop talking about these things and move forward on the vision. Uh, and as, I, as, as you mentioned there, the, the experience in, in Canso is that we need to have firm projects with deliverables and timescales behind it. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was joking with, with Tony the other, the, the other day that uh, in collaboration, collaboration is, very, is actually difficult. Partnership is difficult. You have to work at it, so you have to have something to work on. Um, in, the, in the old days when we were in, in confrontational terms arguing about charges and things, it's really easy to focus and get energy into what we're doing. On air traffic management, we, see we need the same commitment and energy uh, as has been shown on the, on the airline side and the airport side. And that's what we've, that's, we've got to work on real projects. And that's regional projects, not national projects or individual initiatives. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. Both Tony's, Camille uh, and James, thank you very much indeed.